grateful for this opportunity and I trust that God will speak to us. The expectation of the righteous will not be cut short. He will speak to us tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because where your word is, there your power is. We are grateful, O God, for another opportunity to look deeply into your word. We ask that you teach us tonight by yourself. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me. We are expectant. We are ready. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Good evening again. We'll be taking the third in the series of the supernatural. The first one, we had our introduction where we talked about what the supernatural is and the sources of the supernatural. We concluded that God is sovereign. God is the most high, is without limits, and has complete power, ability, and freedom to govern. In the second part, we talked about the Christian life, how it's a new life, and the supernatural ought to be commonplace with in the life of a Christian. We talked about different types of men and the spiritual man being the one who enjoys the power of God. And then we talked about the supernatural, how to operate spiritual the supernatural can operate spiritually and physically and in all areas even mentally and we said that we must always remember that whatever god will do by his spirit he will do by his spirit and the more we fellowship as a christian with the holy spirit therefore the more we live in the supernatural so today we are going on thought of the series and we're talking about life in the supernatural life in the supernatural our text is taken from acts chapter 17 verse 28 acts 17 28 thank you for in him we live and move and we have our being as also some of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring John chapter 15, verse 4 to 5. Thank you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are bond. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Life in the supernatural. Introduction. Many believers in Christ desire the supernatural, but very often it is a desire for a specific issue. So many times you will see that you want God to move in a specific way maybe in terms of healing, in terms of provision, one time, you know, that's what is common. Most believers do not desire the supernatural as a lifestyle, unfortunately. And over the last two uh, lessons, we have learned that the supernatural should, for a Christian, be a lifestyle. It should be an everyday thing. It should encompass, if it can operate in the spiritual, in the physical, in the mental, then it should be about the whole man. It should be about every aspect of our lives so whereas it is very possible to live in the whereas it is very possible to live in the supernatural the supernatural can be our everyday experience it can be our, our daily day to day just the same way you wake up and go to work you can expect the supernatural to occur god is the god of the supernatural and if we are his children then it follows that we also should be. We say, Omoti Ekubabi Ekulajo. So if God, God is this man, then we also should expect, we should also be followed. If we are his children, God of the God, God is the God of the supernatural. If we are his children, then it follows that we also should be of the supernatural. Let's see John chapter 10, verse 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, 
do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world? You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. So here we are we we are told that you are of God. You know, we are God ourselves. Psalm 82, verse 6. I said you are God's, and all of you are the children of the Most High. So if we are God and God is the God of the supernatural, we also we are the supernatural. We are of God. We are God, and the supernatural should be our everyday experience. A life in the supernatural will only confirm the mind of God from the beginning. God's mind from the beginning is for us to live, to be, you know, just like He is, to be the same, and to live in the supernatural. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and females, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see God made man and he made him to have dominion. He created him to have the same power, you know. His mind was to rule over everything. God had a mind from the beginning and it's a life of the supernatural. John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So not just life, not just the regular life, more abundantly will be the supernatural to have more, more of it. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 21 to 23, still talking about God's mind from the beginning. Therefore, let no one boast him men for all things are yours whether paul or apollos or cephas or the world of life or death or things present or things to come all are yours and you are christ and christ is god so god's mind is that everything as long as you belong to christ and christ is god then his mind is that you have all and his mind is that you live in the supernatural malachi chapter 3 verse 6 for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So God, if God does not change, then he has not changed his mind. That mind that he had at the beginning of dominion, that mind of living in the supernatural, he is the God. He does not change. His mind to us, towards us, will not change. He is the God. He will never change. So a life in the supernatural is confirming God's mind. God, from the beginning, he created us to have all of that access, to have everything. He gave it to us, so we must maximize it. Jesus Christ was man while on earth and was subject to natural laws, but he lived a life of the supernatural. He lived a supernatural life. So you can say that, okay, at the beginning, God and man fell and lost all of that privileges. But Jesus Christ came and he came as man. So if he could, and he lived a life of the supernatural. So if Jesus Christ can live in the supernatural as man, then we also have access. We also can live in the supernatural. We can live a supernatural life. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all of who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about as man, but he did all of those things because God was with him. And if he, were, if he was able to do so, we also can. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus. The emphasis is the man Christ Jesus. So he was man on earth, but he lived in the supernatural. He was still the mediator. He still lived a supernatural life. So the man Christ Jesus, he lived as man, but he was able to live a supernatural life. John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept, showing, you know, man, I don't think a spirit being will weep, but Jesus wept here. He's showing that 
he was a man, he had emotions, he had feelings, you know, he was moved to tears. He knew he was man, he was fully man and fully God. Mark chapter 4, verse 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They were on a boat and there was a storm, and Jesus was sleeping hard. In this storm, you know, he was mad, probably tired or just needed to rest. And just like the average man, if he were completely supernatural, I don't think he would need to, to sleep or anything. Just to show us that when Jesus was on earth, he lived as man. How I was subject to natural laws, natural laws of emotions, natural laws of tiredness, natural laws, you know, for him to be sleeping, he was, he lived as man. However, he lived his supernatural life. How God was with him, he went about healing and delivering. So, what is the supernatural lifestyle? The supernatural lifestyle, it was neither a struggle for Jesus, nor was it for anyone whoever lived it. The supernatural lifestyle was not a struggle for Jesus. It was, if you if you follow the accounts, it was as though he would just wake up, you know, normal, it's like watching a movie, just wake up, normal, someone's life being played. There was no struggle about it, whether to turn water to wine or to do all of those things or to heal or to raise the dead. There was no place that there was maybe any, no, it was easy. He lived, it was easy for him and for every other person who lived in the supernatural. There was no no pressure, no force about it. Let's see it in the Bible, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 13. Come to me, all you, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will, please take it back to 29, thank you. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my body light. You know, he was saying, come, this it will not be stressful. It will not be a burden. It will not, my yoke is easy and my body light. You will not need to pay with blood, blood, sweat, and internal organs. You know, it will be easy. It will be easy. Come to me, my yoke is easy and my body light. So it is never a struggle. It's never a struggle. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 to 27. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from, or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Yes. So here is an account of, you know, they needed to pay tax. And, you know, they taunted that. Where would you get money? And it was not even a stress at all. Say, so where do they get money? Go and catch a fish in its mouth, you'll find money. Just like that. And whatever need they had that they had to meet, it was sorted. It was sorted. So it was not a struggle. There was no ha. Ah, so how do we go about this? And then, you know, it was just easy. Go and do this. And the supernatural. Is it is it a normal that a fish will swallow money and hold it in its mouth? That's the supernatural. What that need was catered for supernaturally. There was no struggle about it. It was sorted. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 31. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. Now, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did, why did you doubt? Here, the, the, we see Jesus walking on water. And then he was, you know, he needed to catch up with the boats and he walked on water. And they saw him, they were afraid initially. And the one who had courage said, tell me to come. And he did not say, go and sacrifice this and bring this and that and that. He said, come, just simply come, come. And he stepped out in faith. And for as long as he was coming, he was walking on water too. There was no need, there was no body. Just come, simple, come. And until he now started considering all the parameters and, and walking on water, then he started to sing. And Jesus said, okay, still stretched out his hand. So it's not burdensome for anyone. It's never a struggle. It's never a struggle to live in the supernatural. I don't know if any other person has walked on water after that. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 41. Now when they heard this, they were caught to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Just talking, talking about the Lord, talking about his power, if you will receive, simple, and 3,000, you know, to count the number, to visualize 3,000 people, it's a lot of people. And just talking, just saying by the words inspired by God's word, there was no, it's not a struggle. That's the emphasis. Once we, to live the supernatural, to live in the supernatural, to live the supernatural lifestyle is never a struggle. So by one message, 3,000 who could believe, believed and they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The same Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. But a certain man named Adonias with, his, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife along, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who had these things. Now, at this time, the disciples, the, the disciples, they were, the apostles, all of them, they were gathering, putting together their fonts and all of that. And Ananias and Sapphira, they thought that, okay, let's just leave this part. But they lied. And then immediately judgment came. And he asked, why did you say that? Did anyone force you? No one forced you to bring it. No one said you must bring everything. No one asked you to even sell it in the first place. It's not a struggle. And if you had brought half of it and said, this is a part, this is what we want to give. Why are we reading this? It's not a struggle. It's not compulsory. It's not a, there's no force. There's no, there's no, you must, you know, no cohesion about it. It's a simple, it's an easy life. If you want it, if you desire it, it is not a struggle. So if Ananias and Sapphira, if they had come with what they had and said that this is what we want to give, that they would have been, it would have been acceptable. So it's never a struggle. We don't have to compete. We don't have to lie. We don't have to manipulate anything to live the supernatural lifestyle. Let's see verses 12 to 16. And though the hand of the apostles, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the, the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. 
so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by night by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So the ones who just brought what they had and just dropped it without anybody, nobody monitored, nobody forced them to do it, we see the mighty things that happened through their hands. So much so that they were bringing sick people that the shadow, it may just fall and heal, meaning that it was happening and so much healing, so much in the supernatural, because for the ones who just in simple faith, they just gathered, after the Pentecost gathered, doing God's work and the testimonies, you know, the supernatural followed them. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 39 to 50 talks about David. David and, and Goliath, we know the story. We can read it at home. David and Goliath, you know, he had the sling and he had gone there. Ah, the Goliath had made mouth and said all manner of things and intimidated them. And David got there and he didn't listen. I don't think we have enough time to read it. Let's try. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 39 to 50. And David fastened the sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hands and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in, his shepherd, in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy looking and good looking. Ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to meet me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all, this assembly, then all this assembly shall know that the God does not save with sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord, and it will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David. Then David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. Then he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. And 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. So here he, he had gone to the battle and the king, that got, the king had gotten word that there's someone who wants to face this Philistine and it was David and he tried to give him his armor that okay go with this equipment it will help you but he tried to walk and he couldn't he stayed on the simple thing that he knew to do it was not a struggle this the the sling and the stone and God wrought a great victory through that the emphasis was there at the end of verse 50 that David did not have a sword in his hand and he was able to defeat a seasoned uh, uh, soldier so that definitely is the supernatural. Also, First Kings chapter 18, verse 44 to 46 talks about rain. When he said there will be no rain, and then he said, go and check. And it's, then it came to pass the seventh time that he said there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go, go, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariots and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he gathered up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So man, normal man, 
run ahead of horses, trained horses for a king to ride horses. They will be the best of the best. But God's hand came upon him and he was able to outrun the chariots of the king. That's the supernatural. Just getting himself and going. No struggle. So it's a life if these people could have lived it, we also can. It's never a struggle. Judges chapter 7, verse 1 to 2. Then Jerubabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well, the well of Harod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Let's see the victory. So Gideon and the 100 men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his, own, in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and, and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Akakia towards Zerera as far as the border of Abel Mehola by Tabath. So we see the victory. He, um, they were going to fight the Midianites and they had a whole army. And God said, no, they are too much. Reduce them. And those that took water a particular way, they were the ones, just 300 of them. Imagine going to war with just 300 men. But, and God told them, what was the instruction? Blow the horn and break the pitcher. Does it look like it makes sense for war? But that was what God used to get the victory. The supernatural, out of the ordinary. Not something that they could not have done. But the instruction was easy. It was not a struggle. So the, the presence of God in a life is evidenced by the supernatural. If there is light, if there is electricity going through a wire, if you touch it, you will know. That electricity is flowing through this. That's how the supernatural is. Once the presence of God is in the life, is in a life, then the supernatural is evident. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Now Moses was sending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why this bush does not burn? So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So when there's presence of God, the supernatural, a, bu a bush burning, and it did not burn the leaves. That's the supernatural. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Then he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to, to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So when this holy, where the supernatural is, where life is holy, where the presence of God is, there is the supernatural. In each of these places, they have to say, Okay, this is holy ground. The presence of God is here. And then the supernatural. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So God was with him. God anointed him, and then he went about doing all the good. So where his presence is, the evidence is the supernatural. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17 to 21. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Even when they made a molded cow for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sihon and the king of Heshbon and the land of Agag of Og, king of Basham. Here we see you also multiply their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go. Nehemiah was talking about how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and that the, despite the fact that they were not even always good children, as you put it, but God preserved them. Imagine keeping a nation. <laughs> Recently, I, I had an extra number to my house and I know how it felt. So in my, with this uh, economy, I, so you can imagine keeping a whole nation. God kept them for 40 years. 40 years, nothing, not even their clothes, their, everything was preserved. They ate, they, 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 they dwelt, they, he kept their children, all of that for 40 years. That can only be the supernatural. When they asked for, for bread, he gave them manna. When they asked for meat, they got that supply. That can only be the supernatural. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 to 6. So the presence of God with them brought about that provision. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he said, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. So we can say, the Lord is my helper. If he's there, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if his presence is with us always, then the supernatural will also follow suit. He will never leave us. Then the supernatural will be with us. Now Jesus is the head and we are his body. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 to 23. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Verse 23. Verse 23. Oh, sorry, I imagine that it had. Okay, so let's see 5, chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church and is the savior of the body. So the hus therefore, let just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husband in everything. It's verse 23 that is our emphasis. The husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So Jesus is the head and we are his body. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Colossians 4 is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning? 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Christ is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. Also Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So Jesus is the head and we are his body. Wherever the head goes, the body goes. Whatever is in the head flows through the body and the supernatural lifestyle. If Jesus lived as man and was able to, despite natural laws, live a supernatural life as the head, we as a body, we can. The supernatural should therefore not be far from us. He's actually dwelling in the believer and he wants to express himself through us. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, for whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we are bought, we're bought with a price. He dwells in us, and he wants to express himself through us. John chapter 5, 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. The bearing of the fruit is showing, expressing Christ in us. If we dwell, if we dwell in him, then we'll bear the fruit, the fruits of a tree. And an orange tree will produce orange, orange, oranges. An apple tree will produce apples. So if we dwell in him, if we are connected in him, as is the head, then this, he wants to express himself through us. And that is the supernatural. He shouldn't be far from us because we are in him. We are one with him. And it's the fruits that he produced as man on earth, the same thing, the same fruits of the supernatural for the supernatural lifestyle, therefore, Christ in us makes the difference. Christ in us makes the difference. It is when we dwell in him, it's the Christ that is the difference. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it is Christ that makes the difference. It's in Christ in you. That is the hope of glory. It's Christ in you that the supernatural lifestyle can be without a struggle. First John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. You are of, you, you are of God and because of him that is in you, because of Christ that makes that difference. Let's see Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. And also some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For in him we live and move and have our being. So he's in Christ. Everything is in Christ, through Christ, that makes the difference. Every other thing can be done outside. It's just done. But it's Christ that makes the difference. It's Christ that enables us to live the supernatural lifestyle. If you could do it as man, is that Christ factor. That's the difference with any other thing to see the supernatural. Let's see Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Acts 17, 28. Okay. John 14, 1 to 11 to 12. Thank you. John 14, 11 to 12. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will do all, he will do also. And greater works than this he will do, because I go to my Father. So he's saying, believe in me because I, I, I'm from the Father. Believe in me. And if you believe in me, greater works that I do, 
than I do, you also can do. So the difference is Christ. The difference in, is knowing and being in Christ, accepting him and no, allowing him to live. We have said that if, if he dwells in us, then he wants to express himself through us and that is in the supernatural. So accepting him and being in him, Christ is the one that makes the difference. So if we want to do greater works, if we want to live that supernatural lifestyle, then Christ, we must believe in Christ, we must live in us, we must be one with him. Let's see John chapter 15, verse 1 to 5, still emphasizing, I'm the true vine, and my father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear much fruit, more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So the difference is in the abiding, is in the staying, is in the staying in that place with Christ. Christ makes the difference and it is in the abiding, in dwelling. And that place of dwelling, <coughs> excuse me, and that place of dwelling is in the place of study of the word, is in the place of prayer, is in the place of spending time in his presence. That is abiding in him. The father is a wine dresser, but as long as you are attached, as long as you stay connected, then it makes the difference and you would experience that supernatural lifestyle. So what are the secrets? We have talked about the supernatural lifestyle. We have said if Jesus can live, his, live as man on earth, and then he was able to live the supernatural, it was not a struggle for him, and it is the evidence of Christ, the presence of God in a life. That's the, the supernatural lifestyle. What is the secret of the supernatural lifestyle? The first thing we must know is you must know who you are. That's the first secret of the supernatural lifestyle. You must know who you are. John chapter 1, verse 22 to 23. Then he said to them, Who are you that you may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. This is John speaking. And they were asking him, Who are you? But because he had a clear understanding of his purpose and his calling, he was able to say, I'm the one, I'm the predecessor, I'm the one who will come before him, who you are waiting for. I'm the voice in the wilderness. So John knew he had an understanding of who he was and his assignment. And he was able to tell them when they came to ask him. So also, you must know who you are. Who are you? What are you here for? What are you here for? For such a time as this, why are you here? You must have an idea of who you are, who you are in Christ, of your calling and of your assignment. First John chapter 4 verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You are of God, little children, you have overcome them. You know, we are of God. And knowing that he is with us, we are who are coming from a place of victory already. You have overcome them. Greater is he that is in you. Thank you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Thank you very much. So we must know who we are. You have God. You have God. You have God. If you tell yourself until you believe it, to live in the supernatural, to live a supernatural lifestyle, you must keep reminding yourself you have overcome already. Let's see Micah my, my, my chapter 3, verse 8. Micah 3, 8. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and of might. I am full of power. I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. So I'm not timid. I'm not afraid. I'm full of power. And I've come to speak about justice for you to know who you are. Who are we in Christ? We are not timid. We are not fearful. By the Spirit of God, we are bold. We are full of power. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1. 
Isaiah 43, 1. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So in an understanding of who you are, he says, don't be afraid. I have called you. You, Adirin Salami, he has called me and I am his. I am his. So an understanding, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed of the Lord. An understanding of who you are well, is one of the secrets of the supernatural lifestyle. So I see myself, how he sees me. I know I am redeemed. Then I can live every day in the supernatural. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. At the beginning, at creation, God said, let us make man in our own image, just like ourselves, after our own likeness. So if, if I know that I am in God's image, just as he is, so am I. Knowledge of, there was just that revelation. And he made them to have dominion, to have control over everything, to be fruitful, to multiply. Knowing all of these things will, is the first secret that we are seeing today of the supernatural lifestyle. Knowing who we are, knowing how God's mind and his intention about us will help us to walk and live every day in the supernatural. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 1 to 4, Second Peter, Simon Peter, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this thing, through this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through loss. So all things have been given to us, a knowledge that I can live and enjoy all things that pertain to life and godliness. So once I know who I am, I'm blessed already, exceedingly blessed. I have these great promises and we know that God is faithful. He will perform those promises. So I know because I know I can live a life in the supernatural. I have it already. It's there for me. It's just for me to tap into it. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9, you are holy, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous lights. So I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm his own special person, special girl, that him you may proclaim I may proclaim his promises. So a knowledge of who I am, we know that the Bible says that a hair, if he does not know what he has access to, if he doesn't know it, he will not live in it. So until we know who we are, we have an idea of, the, you know, of, and I'm saying we have an idea because we cannot completely know the full picture, but you, I know who I am. I know the kind of things I'm entitled to as a child. It makes it easy to live the supernatural lifestyle. I have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Then I can walk. I have dominion. I have such great exceeding promises. Be fruitful be mo to multiply. I have all of these things. It will help me in my expectation of living the supernatural lifestyle. The second thing we must note as a secret of the supernatural lifestyle is that you must believe the scriptures. The scripture is God's word. It is supreme. You must believe it, not just to pay lip service, but to believe. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Absolutely nothing. With God, nothing will be impossible. So do I believe it? Do you believe it? Do you think that there's something too hard 
for God? Do you think that this one is above God? God cannot do this anymore. God cannot suck this anymore. You must believe the scriptures. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatever things were written before, were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So all that is contained in the Bible is for us. It's for us to learn, to know, and to believe. If God did it, he can do it. And we must believe the scriptures and not rationalize them. And not think that, how will these things be? How would it be? How would it be? Genesis chapter 30, verse 37 to 43, talking about Jacob, Laban, and the speckles. So Jacob was saying it was time for, for pay, and Jacob, Laban, Jacob was about to leave, and Laban said, wait, I'll pay you your wages. What do you want? He said, okay, the speckled ones. And it, he thought that he would give him the weak part of the flock, that, okay, you take this one. That's what it seemed like. But Jacob, every time they wanted to meet, he would put the crossings and make the markings. And before you knew it, for as long as the animals saw those signs, those things, then they gave birth to speckled and striped and all of that cattle, uh, animals. And after a while, in verse, verse um, the last verse, in verse 43, verse 43, please. Then thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flock female and male servants and camels and donkeys so because he just put those things there and what was supposed to be the weak part of the of the flock he had the 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 stronger part of the flock by the end of the day just that little thing it's in the scriptures and we must believe it it will happen if it happened you know, we must not try to think of the uh, Greek, um, the explanation, the scientific explanation or, or, you know, aspect of it. Sometimes, you know, when God heals, you see some people trying to explain that actually that condition is this, is that God heals. And that is it. That's the absolute truth. God heals. You can live a life of the supernatural. If you expect to live that life, then you must believe God's word a hundred percent. If God says it will happen, I will do it. Then you must believe that it will happen regardless of what the circumstances may look like because it will happen. So we must not rationalize it. We must not think about how would these things be? What would it, how would it come about? The third thing we must do is that you must believe that scriptural experiences can be yours also. So it's not just a written for us to read, it's for us to know that if it happened for them, it can happen for me. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will present us to you. So the same power is available. If it happened, we to John chapter 1 verse 12. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. So you receive him, then you have that same right, you have that same access mark chapter 11 verse 22 to 24 so jesus answered and said to them have faith in god for assuredly i say to you whoever says to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says john chapter 14 verse 11 to 14 john 14 11 to 14 Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Greater works, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he would also do greater works than this he will do, for I go to my Father. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians 3, 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to his power that works in us. So he's able to do, if, he can, if it was recorded, if it had happened by the power of God, we also can experience it. We can experience the healing. We can experience the victory. We can experience the provision. As long as it is written, it can also be our experience. Acts chapter 8, verse 39 to 14. Now, when they came 
up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the Enoch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found as Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So the Spirit took Philip from one place to another. If you believe it, it can also be your experience. The fourth point is that you must be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 14. Romans 8, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So there must be a yielding. You must, you must allow him lead. You must allow him lead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 to 22. Ephesians 2. Now, therefore, you are no longer slaves, strangers, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also were, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So, together, being being yielded all of us we are being built together so we must be yielded we must allow him to take the lead and follow and number five tonight is that you must not grieve the holy spirit so if we are being yielded to the holy spirit we must not grieve that spirit we must obey psalm 78 verse 40 says how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert so it's possible to grieve the holy spirit we must not ephesians 4 30 and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption hebrews chapter 3 verse 17 now with whom was now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness because they grieved the Holy Spirit. They grieved the Holy Spirit and that was the consequence. Isaiah chapter 63, 9 to 10 says, talks about being afflicted and he bore them with love all days. He kept them. Verse 10. And they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and fought against them. That's the consequence of grieving the Holy Spirit. So we must be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Exodus chapter 23, 20 to 21. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him. Do not grieve him for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. So we must obey beware of him that take 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 notice of him be careful not him observe him but do not grieve him do not grieve him matthew chapter 12 verse 31 therefore i say to you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men so we must not grieve the holy spirit the secrets of the supernatural lifestyle we must know who we are we must believe the scriptures we must believe that the scriptures scriptural experiences can also be ours we must yield to the spirit to lead and to direct us and we must not grieve as long as we are yielded to him we must not grieve the holy spirit and if we do all of these things well that's the secret to a supernatural lifestyle. Finally, this supernatural lifestyle is the expectation of God for his people. That's God's mind for his people. Isaiah chapter 43, 21 to 22. These people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have not been, and you have been weary of me, O Israel. He has formed us, he expects us. To, he, for, to show forth his praise and that is with the supernatural but know that the supernatural without God will lead to disaster anything outside of God is a counterfeit and a counterfeit would always fail it will lead to a disaster it is in Christ that we have that connection it is in Christ that we have the fullness it is through him and by him for it, in him we live and move and have our being. Let's bow our heads and react to God's word. Let's ask him to help us. Let's tell him we desire to live, to walk in the supernatural. <laughs>